Hi guys, uh, I'm going to start a series about survival analysis and this video is going to be the intro um, to survival analysis. Survival analysis is also called time to event analysis and it's basically it's it's its own field in statistics and a good question I'm asking myself is why do we even need a new field in statistics? Um, basically, we are modeling a non-negative quantity. It's a time up to some event. Most often, this event is death or a disease. And so this is kind of a morbid field in statistics. Um, yeah, but so this is a non-negative quantity. And we have distributions to model non-negative quantities. For example, we can take the log normal or the gamma all the different gamma distributions, right? The exponential, the chi-square, et cetera. This is if we have um, continuous data. If we have discrete data, let's say uh, time to an event given by days and days is discrete, then we can use maybe geometric or Poisson, I'm not sure, but there, there are also discrete uh, non-negative distributions. And so why can't we use them? For example, let's say that we have we want to predict the time to some event based on some given covariance that we have. And so we could take, for example, the log of the time and fit a linear regression to it, or we can fit a gamma generalized linear model to it. There are ways to do it. But I think the big difficulty uh, with regards to survival analysis is something called censoring. So in survival analysis, we usually don't observe uh, the complete time of uh, all on, on all of our observation. So for some observation, we might observe the time of the event, but for other observation, we might um, uh, only observe that the, that the event didn't happen until a certain time. And for simplicity, I'm only going to consider what is called right censoring for now. There's also another complication called truncation. I, I won't cover this also now. Um, so yeah, this is a major complication for us. If we want to incorporate this data that we have, that all we know about it is that up to a certain time, the event didn't happen, but we don't know exactly when the event happened after that time, then it creates some uh, complications for us. So for example, why might we have censoring? One example is that a patient that we were, uh, we were following in our um, research left the research. He left the country, uh, he left our um, hospital, and we don't know if he or she died. Okay, so this is an example of random censoring. It can also be that we only followed a group of patients for a specific uh, time window and after that, we stopped the research because we wanted to publish the, the paper, yeah? So, so in this case, we know the sensor time. It's not a random variable so much, or it's a degenerate random variable. Uh, it's called type one censoring. And everyone who didn't get the event by this time, we don't know the exact time that they did get the event. Okay, and you can think about it like this. So if we have, so if we have say time here, then it could be that we followed some patient and then it had the event. And it could be that we followed some patient and then it got censored, he left uh, the group. And in any case, it could be that here we stopped following. So all the patients, once they get here, then they are automatically censored, yeah? Okay, so as I mentioned, this adds complexity to our analysis. Um, and going back to GLMs, they are fitted using maximum likelihood. So how do we calculate the likelihood of our data based on partial information? Uh, the whole framework doesn't really work here. And so the way to model this is we say, basically, we now have either two random variables or one random variable and one degenerate random variable. We have the time to an event, we mark it by X, and we have the sensor time, we mark it by C. And of course, we can only observe one of the two. So if a patient had an event, it, it doesn't have to be a patient, yeah, but let's continue with this example. 
if a patient had an event, then we know that it's X, we know the event time. And if the patient, patient was censored, then we know it's C, we know the C time, but we don't know it's X and vice versa. So we can summarize the data by just the, the different times, okay, which is the minimum between uh, the event time and the sensor time. But basically it's all the times that we observed and an indicator variable, a delta, which one will indicate an event and zero will indicate censoring. So we, will, we can summarize the entire data by the times and whether this time represents an event or a censoring. So this will be our data, the time and whether it's an event or a sensor for each observation. Now, when we only had our axes, when we only had, for example, the times, and if we observed the times of the event for the entire data. Well, usually we describe the distribution using PDFs or CDFs. So for example, if we were to model the time with uh, an exponential distribution with parameter lambda, then usually we would talk about the uh, PDF probability density function, which is this, or the CDF, which is this. And they completely define the distribution. But in survival analysis, we usually look at other quantities the survival function, the hazard or the risk function, which are the two that I will cover now, and the mean residual life, which I won't cover for now. So what is the survival function? Well, the survival function is basically just one minus the CDF, one minus the cumulative distribution function. Okay, and uh, notice that from this we get, if we apply some math, we get that the PDF is just the negative of the derivative of the survival function. Right, because if we this if we take the derivative here on both sides, this will give us the PDF, and here we'll get the ne the negative uh, derivative of this. Also, notice that uh, for continuous variable, the survival function is basically just the integral of the PDF from the point n onward. For discrete uh, x, it's just the sum of the PMFs, yeah, the probability mass function for all the uh, discrete time points after the current time that we are looking at. Okay, so if the CDF usually looks like something that starts at zero and eventually goes into one, then the survival function looks exactly the opposite. It starts at one and it eventually goes to zero, right? It's like in uh, the movie Fight Club on a long enough uh, time, rate everyone's survival drops to zero. So this is what he's talking about. Now that we have the survival function, it will be easier to think about the likelihood for sensor data. So suppose we are looking at X that is exponential with Lambda and suppose that we have uh, censoring at 0 0.5. Okay, if I look at the CDF of three different parameters, okay, you can see in purple, it's with the parameter lambda is equal to one. In green, it's with the parameter lambda is equal to two. And in, in red, it's with the parameter lambda is equal to four. And now if all I know is that the event didn't happen by the time C equal uh, half. So by the time half, you can see it here with the dashed line, the event still didn't happen. I ask you, what do you think is more likely to be the parameter? Is, is lambda equal to one more likely than lambda equal to two, less likely than lambda equal to two, et cetera. Maybe take a pause and think about it. And for those of you who came back, well, what does it mean for C to be equal to half and lambda to be equal to one? Well, if lambda is equal to one, not so many people had the, the event by the time half. So the probability of having the event by time half is not so big. There's a greater chance that people will survive until time half, there's a greater chance that, that we will see a sensor by this time and not an event. But for example, if lambda is equal to four, most people already experienced the event by, by time half if the lambda is equal to four. Okay, so almost 90%, uh, yeah, 88% or so, experienced the event uh, by time half. So it's kind of less likely that our parameter is equal to four if we see a sensor at time half, because 
most likely the event already happened. And the intuition here is harder with the f of x, with the CDF, but if we move to the survival function, maybe it becomes a bit easier. Um, so the only thing that the survival function does, it's one minus the CDF, but it kind of makes more intuitive sense now, right? So um, the S of X for lambda equal to one is larger at the point half than for lambda equal to two and for lambda equal to four. And this means that there is still more probability that an event didn't occur by time half for lambda equal to one than for lambda equal to four. And so this is what we will use now for the likelihood in survival analysis. So for type one censoring, again, we said that the, the sensor time is known. It's a constant, it's not a random variable. So the likelihood of some parameters is the product over all observation. And for each observation, if, if, we, if we had an event for that observation, then it's just the PDF of that event. And if we don't have an event for this uh, observation, if it was censored, then it's just the survival function at that time. Okay, this will give us the indication whether these parameters are more likely or less likely. If the censoring is random, then it has its own density and survival function, right? So we can denote them by f of c and s of c. Since we also assume that the x's and c's are independent, then the likelihood becomes, <clears throat> due to the same logic that applied before, um, this thing, right? Because if there was an event, then for the events, we, we look, we have the PDF, but for the censoring time, all we know is that censoring didn't happen until some point. So we use the survival of the censoring. And if uh, an event didn't happen, so we have a censoring, then we use the uh, PDF of the censoring, but we use the C, the survival function of the event. And if we further assume that the censoring doesn't depend on the parameters that we are interested in, then we can just ignore the censoring terms and the likelihood will be proportional to this, right? Because when we do maximum likelihood, we take the log which, with regards to the parameters of interest, we equate it to zero, then everything that uh, won't be X will disappear. Okay, cool. So we can already fit our data using maximum likelihood. To finish this video, let's just uh, look at what is the hazard function. So for a continuous uh, time, the hazard function is defined as the limit of this quantity over here. So in the numerator, we have the probability that X is between little X and a small delta after that, given that X uh, is after is bigger than little X. And this is divided by the delta. So in words, it basically is the instantaneous probability of an event at a certain time, given that you survived event-free up to that time. And the hazard is usually more informative than the density, the CDF, and the survival function with regards to survival analysis. So notice that with a little bit of math, we can um, uh, open the conditional here and make it the joint divided by uh, what was conditioned on. And then the joint, well, this just gets swallowed in, right? This thing over here, it just gets swallowed in with this thing. So uh, we get the same thing here. And this thing is just the survival function. This is the definition of a survival function. And now notice that if we take the limit uh, of this thing over here, then this is exactly the definition of the derivative, right, of the, of the CDF, or it's just the definition of the PDF, right? So this is what we get in the end. We get the PDF at that point divided by the survival at that point. So if we have an exponential model, then the hazard will be constant because uh, this will be the uh, PDF, this will be the survival function. They cancel out and we are left with the lambda, which is a constant. Again, with some math, we can uh, we already saw that f of x is actually the negative uh, derivative of s of x. And then this whole thing can be described as the negative uh, log of s of x uh, taking the derivative of that. 
The cumulative hazard is just the integral of the hazard from zero to some time. And um, since we said this is the negative of this derivative, so the integral just becomes this thing without the derivative. And if we plug in x and zero, we get this thing. S of x at zero, we said is one, ln of one is zero. So we just get that this is equal to minus ln of S of x. And if we change terms, then we get that uh, S of x is e to the power of minus the cumulative hazard function. And also notice that if we take the limit as x goes to infinity, then this thing, uh, this stays zero, but this thing goes to S of x at infinity. And we said that S of x at infinity is always zero. So this whole thing approaches minus ln of zero. And this is, of course, infinity. This was for the continuous x, for discrete x. The hazard is defined as the probability of an event happening in this time frame, in today, for example, given that we survived up to this time, so that the time can only be today and onward. And again, using condition probability, we develop it into this thing. This is the survival, but it's the survival not at xj, not at the current time frame. It's the survival uh, from yesterday, right? Because s of xj is the probability that x is bigger than xj, but here we have bigger or equal, okay? So this is basically the probability that x is bigger than xj minus one. We can also divide p of x equal to x of j as s of x at xj minus one minus s of x at xj. This will give us this thing. And then it's just equal to one minus uh, this thing over here. If we change terms, then this thing is equal to one minus this thing. Notice that we can write the survival function uh, in the discrete case as a multiplication of this geometric product, right? Because here everything will cancel and this thing is equal to one. Okay, so we are allowed to do this. And notice that we said that this thing over here is just each one of these terms, it's just one minus h of x, little h of x at those at that point. So we can take then this is equal to the product of this. Okay, and for the cumulative hazard, the most obvious definition will be just the sum of the individual hazards. Uh, but notice that in this case, we don't contain the same relation as before that we had in the continuous case. Remember, in the continuous case, we showed that the survival function is equal to e to the power of the cumulative hazard function. And here it doesn't, we don't get the same relation, but we can do an approximation. Noticing that for really small values, then X is approximately the same as minus ln one minus X. And you can see this here in this graph that I made. So you see X and minus ln one minus X for small values, for values here, for values here, this line and this line are basically almost the same. So we re can replace this with that. And now notice that actually, the relationship does hold now. So this is uh, basically the hazard, uh, both for the continuous and the discrete, and both for the regular hazard and the cumulative hazard. And this is all I wanted to show in this video. I hope you enjoyed it. Please leave a like and subscribe, and see you all in the next video.